All right, so let's uh, uh, go on to my uh, panel. I will come back to uh, Arvind and Jayant uh, in due course, but I'd like to start off with um, uh, Binguman. Um, you know, trade is, is critical. Um, and digitalizing payment systems, trade platforms, we still are largely still paper-based trade uh, platforms. Would you like to talk about what Standard Chartered has been doing in that area of you know digitalizing trade platforms? Yeah, so I'll touch a little bit on uh, on the local domestic economy and what what we have seen in the last <coughs> six seven months. And I'll come back to the bank. Uh, Riaz, what has happened is actually with the trade embargo in Sri Lanka, a lot of the trade have gone into uh, dock trade like LCs, LC opening, and unfortunately in Sri Lanka most of the corporates are not into uh, electronic LC opening. They're all into manual LC opening. So this is something that we've been educating as an industry to uh, get, uh, you know, corporates into the system and, you know, open LCs on the system. Because if you go to the other markets, what you see globally is the open account trade is picking up and the dock trade or the base trade is coming down. Whereas for Sri Lanka, we're in a unique situation because of reserve position, we have put import embargoes. Uh, so the, uh, the you know the, the LC business has become one of the key businesses, and we see a challenge in corporates not doing online LCs. Uh, so as a bank, what we've done is, especially on the cash side, we've gone with this you know war on cash. Actually, we declared this I think before COVID, and we converted all the clients into uh, you know straight to bank in, into our electronic banking platform where the trade will 90 plus percent of our you know uh, cash that's pretty much you know payments done on the for the suppliers on electronic. On the trade piece is slowly picking up. I think uh, there's a big transformation for the industry as well. Uh, but I think clients are pushed into online trade because of the situation we are in and we've seen progress in that area as well. Thank you, uh, Binguman. I'm going to come to Zulfa. Uh, you, you run, I think, one of the most successful startups uh, that Sri Lanka has seen. You know, we are going through... Uh, a tough time with uh, COVID um, and businesses are, are struggling. We are all looking for an economic revival. How do you see startups driving this economic revival for the country? I think if I may talk about the tech startups, I think, I think uh, uh, the tech startups uh, can play a huge role in our economic revival. I think it starts off with uh, many things. Obviously, one is... Uh, uh, the policymakers taking the right decisions to encourage more more uh, entrepreneurs to set up businesses. You know, there are entrepreneurs in our country uh, who are trying to do so many new things. And then obviously there are Sri Lankans overseas that can actually come back and set up uh, institutions here. Uh, at the same time, if, if the right policies are put in place, I'm sure there'll be more startups that will begin. Uh, the other factor that needs to be looked into, and I think Arvind sort of touched on upon that, is, is opening uh, the, these platforms per se. Now, India talks about the India stack. I think we need to build our own uh, set of stacks that these startups can evolve on or run on, right? So payment is one. You know, uh, I think there's been a lot of startups, uh, entrepreneurs who've been knocking on the central bank, trying to, uh, you know, get the digital payment uh, ecosystem going, right? I think we need to start somewhere. Uh, then obviously there are other uh, departments and institutions in our country that needs to open up. For, for young entrepreneurs, right? So that they can, you know, sort of take that services to the public, right? I think uh, Arvind also talks about the, the fourth industrial revolution, which I'm a great believer in. I think the future of our country is dependent on how well we do here, right? We've missed the last three, right? Now, if you want, if, if, if the government wants us to take advantage of it, I think now is the time. We need to make that decision right now so that we can evolve and, and create a great uh, fourth industrial revolution for, the, for, for all the citizens of our country. And I think with that, you will see uh, entrepreneurs coming up, startups uh, growing, and you will have unicorns and, and decacorns and all these other new companies that will evolve through this. And that's the opportunity that we as the startups in our country are looking forward for. Thanks, so for, uh, I'm going to come to Chinti. Um, you know, we, we're talking about digitalizing uh, things. And, but we still have a transition between the old world and the new world. And I know your company has done a lot of trying to bridge uh, the old, old world business, trying to deal with the new world uh, systems. Would like to talk to us a little about uh, 
what you have done in that space? Sure, um, I can probably hone in on three case studies. Uh, I think that'll help uh, answer that question. And I'll also talk a little bit and I'll correlate it to what we saw uh, in Arvind's presentation. One is around uh, the connectivity, right? We are in a world of interoperability where businesses have to be enabled to talk to other businesses uh, to service the customer. Today, we think about business to customer when it comes to digitization, but there's a huge scope around B2B. Uh, one such example I, I'll pick, and I'll take you sort of on a tour of the world, if you will, uh, was from a client in Vietnam. Uh, now, Vietnam is very rich in fintechs. Uh, it's very, uh, it encourages for entrepreneurship. It's obviously very uh, tech savvy. There's a lot of investment going, opening up the market, and it has produced a significant amount of fintechs. And what this bank wanted to do was really open the bank up to integrate and provide services. So even if it was to take your taxi ride, I would be able to pay with my wallet. Uh, I would be able to do anything essentially uh, interconnected to the bank. Now, we do have wallets here, but they tend to be within the bank itself, but we need to be able to open up. So one of the things that uh, we implemented there was the integration and the API layer secured, obviously, uh, for each partner to come in on board, get onboarded into the bank. Um, so it took about, I think the, the project took about three to six months uh, to get, because obviously there's a lot of legacy systems. We've got to make sure that those are connected in a secure way. We also have to build platforms, uh, which are microservices based, containerized, so that you can actually change things uh, as required. And within now, uh, you know, getting another partner on board is just taking, you know, probably a few hours for them. So that is a great example of making sure you sort of bridge the gap over sort of brick and mortar, uh, you know, lots of systems uh, that are, don't talk to each other to now like opening up to the external parties. The second uh, Aravind talked about was data as oil. I, I, data is the new currency. Um, and I'll take you um, in, as an example. Uh, we work with a pharmacy, pharmaceutical retailer in Australia. Um, they have over 500 retail stores, 5,000 employees, and their business model is actually to enable the local pharmacy under their umbrella. Now imagine this from a systems perspective, from a data collections perspective, you are talking multiple data sources, multiple systems. And one of the things that we were able to do is bring it all together. Uh, we leveraged the Azure platform from a data warehousing perspective, uh, leveraged uh, analytics and what it, so it was actually first to get data insight. It was know your customers. It was to help them market and upsell. However, we also were enabled, uh, enable them to really plug in the supply and demand uh, to understand obviously the pharmaceutical products that came in as well as FMCG products that they were uh, demonstrating. So the entire process had a now, you know, earlier it was just data, now it was insight. So that really drove uh, the business and, and it's booming and they're sort of, I think, uh, you know, taking on new uh, pharmacies every day. Uh, <clears throat> the third one I will pick from the US because um, you know, there's computing power. We talk about artificial intelligence. We talk about machine learning, and they are bleeding it, uh, you know, and leading the the market. But we've seen them being used mostly for data, right? Analyze data models, uh, take it to market, etc. So uh, now we are implementing uh, through a partner uh, artificial intelligence to tackle language. Now, language is really complex. You know, um, you could you just asked me a question. I gave you three things. You understood what I was saying because you understand context, right? Uh, how would a machine do that? So we are actually leveraging AI to uh, tackle language. And the reason is this. Through the pandemic, you know, call centers saw, saw uh, you know, major rise in calls coming in over 70% across the globe, just these are just stats across the globe. Um, and a lot of the time, all these call centers miss the 80-20 rule, which is 80% of the time a call needs to be answered in 20 seconds or less. It, obviously, we are unable to do this. And in this situation, in a pandemic, when you really need to care for your customers, address them when they want your help, we couldn't be there. 
So how do we, I mean, this is not going away anytime soon. So how do we tackle this? You know, populations are growing, people are getting more used to it. This is where a conversational AI that will help divert. This is not an IVR. I, I just want to be very clear. It's not an IVR. Uh, uh, but a, a conversational AI that can actually have a conversation with the caller, understand slang, understand uh, colloquial terms that we might use to actually comprehend the conversation, comprehend the need, and thereby driving a better experience. And this is really important because they say digitization, while it's great, also will eliminate brand, the need for brand, right? So people may not come to you because you are the big bank or you are the big, you know, whatever it is, right? Healthcare provider, shoe provider, whatever it is. They will come to you if you service them quickly and fast. So these are, I thought, three uh, examples that would be very interesting for our listeners. Thanks, Jint. You talked, you, you used a few words. The data is a new oil and data is so valuable. Um, and I'm going to ask this question from Jayanta. Um, as we embark on the digitalization journey, um, lots of uh, transactions are going to be done with the uh, government. And unfortunately, as of now, governments are sometimes notoriously lax on the security. Um, you know, we hear of websites being hacked and, you know, so people have a natural fear about transacting with government with regard to the uh, cyber security aspect. I know you're bringing a new cyber security bill, all that, but how, how are you planning to ensure to give confidence to the people to be able to transact with government agencies and departments uh, in the knowledge that the data that they share with them will be secure? I'm sure you have some plans to that. Jayanta? Uh, yes, uh, in most of the garment information, uh, uh, other than few agencies, uh, would be in the national cloud uh, uh, or the ICTA cloud, which will be owned, managed, and uh, securitized by us. Uh, so we are very uh, we are aware of it. Uh, we are we are going into a uh, lot of uh, precautions. Uh, we are going to put uh, uh, major uh, physical uh, rules also into that. Uh, uh, if you want, I can spell them out because there'll be uh, top people in this country like uh, the Chief Justice, uh, a few of the judges, the Vice Chancellors who will be the custodian of this data. Uh, so they would have, uh, I mean, obviously, so you have to, they are the top guys, you have to trust them. Uh, somehow you have to trust someone. And uh, so it's obvious that uh, we are trying to put them over. Uh, we are going to have many other precautionary uh, controls uh, where we, uh, they would uh, also be, be engaged. Uh, obviously the uh, as you rightly said, the Data Protection Act, uh, which was there hanging for a long time, uh, is on the verge of being approved. Uh, it's at the cabinet level. Uh, cyber security bill, uh, the electronic signatures, uh, these all came up and uh, we are quite serious about it. And um, we would actually be as good as any other country. I mean, these are these are the only things that uh, I mean, uh, done by many other countries. We will build confidence. Uh, one of the key areas that we are going to bring in is transparency. Uh, uh, the present government is very keen on this, and, and uh, there will be a lot of transparency that would come in. Uh, it's not a matter of uh, opening data. It is a matter of transparency and giving the right information to the right person. Uh, so that's what uh, we have, we have taken this up very seriously. And uh, if you take the first thing that we came in, uh, that's what we did because we have come from private sector, all of us. Uh, so yes, uh, you have any questions, Arvind? Uh, yes, so uh, I hope you can hear me. 
can. We can. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we have taken a lot of precautions, and uh, just like, and we have uh, discussed with a lot of other uh, agencies in the world who are very recognized. Uh, we are going uh, bringing the stamps in to the uh, processors. So uh, this will be quite transparent, and we will take care the data that is quite uh, secured, and the right person uh, knows the right information. Thanks, John. Arvind, I'm going to come to you. Uh, you know, uh, you have gone ahead in your digitalization journey. You talked about the different stacks, the payment stack, payment layer, the transaction layer. Now, when you go into a digitalization transaction, uh, and considering that India and Sri Lanka, as giant to say, it's not far behind, a lot of rural uh, uh, mass out there. How do you ensure that, you know, uh, that there is some, some level of protection is given to uh, protect people who are not as tech savvy or who is not as street smart, been taken for right. We heard of payroll scams and all sorts of other type of things. I know you can say that you know it's a there is a there is a terms and conditions there, and you know people must you know look after themselves. But I don't think we can get away with that, particularly when we are aware that a lot of our people are still rural based. How did India handle this? And maybe it'll be a good lesson for Sri Lanka as well. Thank you uh, for that question, uh, but let me start with giving a, a small thought on uh, what you were discussing with Mr. Jayanta De Silva. Um, security of data is one aspect, but also is the aspect of privacy. Who owns the data and who can sh it be shared with? And I think uh, as countries take control of their data, they need to think of regulation, but not over-regulation. Uh, you know, the, we have a, a startup uh, a representative here today. They will vouch for this. Chinti will vouch for this, that there is a lot of economic value in data. So the consumer is willing to share that economic value So, and, and, and get a better credit to answer your question, to get a better credit, better loan, rather than getting a, a, a shark loan, um, uh, you know, uh, through a licensed operator, we should have that ability to do that. So number one point is there should be balance between privacy, regulation, and innovation. And over-regulation should not kill innovation. And, and that's, uh, that is, uh, that is a, a small piece of uh, advice that I have. And the second point is coming to your uh, question on um, whether, uh, you know, whether, how are we protecting consumers? Number one is, uh, you know, overall, any identity system and what I heard from Mr. Jayanta De Silva was the same. That first of all, you know, unlike an ATM card, where you have an ATM card, a bank card, which can be given to a, a, a family member, a friend, and you say, this is the, the pin number, the ATM pin number, go and withdraw money. A, a digital identity, which is biometrically verifiable, cannot be shared. You are your password. And that's the biggest form of security that you have. So number one, so it, it, it has much lesser chances of being, uh, being gained. Two, uh, today you have a very big disparity between people, and this, is, uh, this, is, this was a case in India too, and still is a case, India is a very big country, where people who are giving loans, who have access to money, and people who want to receive those loans, whether payday loans or two-day working capital loans or week-long working capital loans, they, uh, the shark loans really, they, they really don't know how to access better credit. And that's where data really and digital uh, platforms really play a big role. I, I, I mean, I can tell you yesterday, that India is currently, as we are hosting the Sri Lankan Economic Summit, um, India is hosting what is called the Indian uh, FinTech um, Awards. Every second presentation is about how a better algorithm is being written to give better credit to consumers, whether it's B2B or B2C, means business to business or business to consumer. So a small loan of 500 Sri Lankan rupees for one day, um, or, you know, and, and if people start paying that, they have eligibility of 1,000, 1,200, and that's how data and, you know, how, how the smartphone is really helping them. So. Uh, 
I think the, a, a long answer for countries, uh, yours and ours, lies in creating opportunities, democratizing credit, making it available to everybody. And for that, you do need the last mile uh, connectivity. You need a lot more banking. You need a lot more data to be able to make those credit decisions on an instance and instantaneously you know, put that money in a person's credit card or a prepaid card or a wallet and be able to then uh, get the money back in EMIs on, on, a, on a constant basis. You need your own payment systems. You need a lot of access to credit and you need better regulation. Third thing is, which India did, and I just want to leave it there, is open up the banking sector. You know, we had uh, 21 banking licenses, new banking licenses given out in two years, something that was done in 30 years previous to that. Um, and you really, really saw only four or five big private banks being built out in India, ICICI, HDFC, and a few others. But look at, look at the last five years. You have new payment banks being set up by all wallet companies. You have small business banks being set up, and this has been enabled by agile policy making. These are, these are specialized banking licenses, and, and once you have a banking license, you know that you're not going to an unauthorized operator. So uh, that, that's, that's the lesson we have so far. It's a continuous journey. We are, not, we are not at the end of the tunnel yet. Thank you, Arvind. That, I think that was very useful. Uh, Bikuba, um, Zulfa talked about uh, uh, startups can drive economic revival. Try the banker. Uh, do you think the bankers have or provide the right enabling environment for startups to, to grow? I'm, I'm talking about, you know, banks traditionally insist on security and whatnot and personal guarantees. And for startups, you know, they're young guys, they don't have personal guarantees, they don't have assets worth very much, maybe later on. How do you think that banks can play that role? Yeah, but as a startup business, if you look at globally, 90% of the startups would fail in the first five years. And out of the 90%, out of the 10%, another, out of the 90%, 90% would fail because of not having consistent cash flows, you know, self-funding. Uh, so our experience on the startup business is like, unless you have a proper governance structure, it's very difficult for banks to come and participate because the constant monitoring has to happen. So what we have seen in the markets is like, especially when it comes to startups, like if you're, you have two things that you look at, one is profitability. If you want to go for a startup and you want to create profits, then you, it makes sense for a go for a bank, go for a bank loan. You know, it can be clean be based on a criteria. So you, you borrow and you, you know, move forward. But if you want to create value for a, for a startup, you know, a lot of the startups would create value without profitability. You need crowdfunding, you need a, you know, angel investor to come in. Uh, the common thing that we have seen is angel investors coming in uh, and investing in these startups. They believe in the startup, they put money behind the startup. One thing is very clear, if you put money behind a startup, you have to be ready to fail and lose your money. Uh, so names like Kickstarter is a classic example. They've been helping people with more than $5 billion. Uh, I think 19 million people were in, impacted over more than 200,000 projects in multiple markets. Typical crowd, you know, crowdfunding uh, program where you put a proposal in place and you know, investors will come and say, I want to take part of this business. So banks, can banks also get into crowdfunding? That's a possibility. Can banks lend uh, clean? Yes, it's possible. But there has to be policy framework around how do we identify the right entrepreneurs? Because in markets like Malaysia, I think there's this graduate entrepreneur program. I think we launched something very similar in Sri Lanka with this 500,000 rupee, uh, you know, startup uh, funding. Uh, I think we should embrace that. We should join that and support the industries, but the policy framework has to be right. And also for the startups, very important to understand the youngsters who are getting into this space, they should do market research before getting into a business. Just because the, there's a lucrative business, they should not get in. They should understand what your market is, what your proposition is. Uh, we see a big problem of not having enough expertise in these startups and they don't want to partner. So I think I, I advise for the, these youngsters who partner with some expertise and then come with a valid, valid, you know, a viable proposal to a bank and banks will fund. We are getting there. We're not there yet. Even though they're semi-funding, there are a lot of complaints around not doing clean. But having said that, banks have a huge clean portfolio on their semi-business as well. But startup is a new thing for Sri Lanka. Zulf, uh, I, a lot of lot of what uh, uh, Bingumal talked about, uh, I think uh, Pikmi has done it right. Would you like to talk about you know, is it when uh, when when you came to the market, um, you were taking on an international giant who was already established. Um, 
and lots of people thought that you may still not succeed in, in taking them on, but you did. Um, you'd like to tell us how you got up because you did certain things right. Yeah. And maybe that's something that our startup uh, entrepreneurs out there can learn from. Yeah, certainly. I, I mean, so the story is a little reverse. We started, we had the first move advantage. So we obviously started much earlier than uh, the competition that you see here. So I think, uh, uh, I think, I think obviously, you know, it was challenging. It was never easy. Uh, obviously, one of the first places I did go was the banks. They were not of any help, uh, sadly. But, uh, but re then obviously when the business started and we've, we've showed enough revenues to the banks, then only they opened, they, op they welcomed us in open arms. Let me put it that way, right? Because before it was more like, hey, you know what? We, we don't understand what you're doing. Uh, you know, we can't do what you want us to do. So it was, it was a discussion like that. But I think right now we work with almost all the eight commercial banks in the country. You know, if, I, if we make a call, he's right outside our door. It's, it's that, it's that. I think, I think they need to, look forward to opportunities. I think the commercial banks will have to look forward to opportunities. I understand, like Bhima said, the risk of startups. Obviously, that is there. And I think uh, experience would totally tell, you know, whether you want to back this company or not. And obviously, it creates the opportunity for angel investors, right? I think, I think that's where venture capitalists and angel investors come in because commercial banks can't do this, right? So I think it's an opportunity for, 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 for the rich folks to open up their purse and, you know, fund these young startups. I think it gives, uh, great, gives them a great return. And I think uh, my story, and I've given some of my angel investors uh, uh, a 10x, 20x return. So, which is, which is a fantastic story. Uh, yeah, so I think in short, that's how it has been. Uh, uh, obviously, you know, we've attracted uh, funding from now from IFC, uh, which, you know, for the first time that IFC has come forward and invested in, in a local startup in our country. Uh, and I think uh, I think the journey is on, and we we obviously have a lot of aspirations. Uh, we think uh, we're not just uh, we started as a taxi hailing company. Uh, today we are we are essentially a super app play, uh, a mobility solution provider. So I think the journey is going on, and I think uh, we have a long way uh, ahead of us. I think one thing you got right was you got your governance right. Yes, I think that was critical. Um, Jayanta, I'm going to come back to you. Um, I know um, that you. ICTA has some uh, some plans about you know nurturing startups to make sure that we we weed out the you know the the, the, the potential from the you know wannabes. Um, can you just talk a little about what your plans are to make sure that that you know we give the startups a decent uh, strike at success? Uh, <clears throat> coming from private sector, to be very honest. Uh, uh, we believe a lot in startups, and um, we think uh, startup and innovation would drive especially our, our field. Uh, so as ICTA, I would say we have uh, three, uh, three major programs coming up. Uh, the first program is actually we at ICTA is going to have startup labs inside the ICTA, uh, giving all the support and especially uh, directing uh, the young guys in which direction, the, uh, as uh, Sulfa or uh, I think Sulfa was saying, um, you know, you have to have the right, uh, 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 right direction. Uh, this is something uh, which is uh, lacking. Uh, we interviewed 10 startups uh, very recently with a probable investor and uh, that particular investor sort of didn't take any of these uh, startups. He was not uh, uh, willing to sort of work with them. Uh, so you have to, uh, just because there is some, uh, you know, like, you know, trying to someone trying to follow Zulfa, it's not the best thing to do, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> right. Uh, likewise, you know, the startups, uh, so we have to educate them, guide them in the business. So what we are trying to do is we are going to offer them uh, facilities and helping and guiding them. And after one year uh, of uh, the selected startups, uh, we are going to give them another opportunity to sort of work with large companies in Sri Lanka, uh, give them the opportunity to showcase uh, their products at a very uh, sort of uh, uh, prominent, uh, uh, I can't name it at the moment, a very prominent place where people gather 
so we are, uh, have already decided on that. Uh, the third aspect is actually we are working with companies, large companies, uh, who are ready to invest. 11 companies have already sort of come up. And uh, to invest in start, uh, it's not the normal startups, traditional startups, to have IF, uh, to start R&D labs in the universities. So what happens is uh, traditionally we have had this uh, informal uh, type of uh, uh, research type of work in the universities, but it was mainly focused on, on their academic uh, uh, exams and after they leave, it dies out. So what we want to do is uh, now uh, work with these companies. I will just give one example, maybe uh, a preservation of vegetables. Uh, a certain company would come up and work with this particular university, they will invest, they will, uh, they will uh, work with these guys and then put them into uh, the commercial uh, practice. Uh, the same way we have identified many other aspects uh, uh, for startups, uh, which are very like, uh, not only, uh, you know, uh, that comes as a, as a profitable venture, but something like uh, dengue, how to handle dengue, uh, like that, you know, we'll have uh, the elephant-human uh, conflict. Uh, so they would work and they would have uh, research labs uh, working uh, and there'll be, uh, there'll be, the bottle would come as a commercial uh, product. So these are the things that we are doing other than the normal startup work that we have already been doing for the last 10 years. Yeah, there is a question. I'm looking at some questions that are now coming through. Um, one question, and I think there's a double barrel question in this. says, uh, what is the GOSL, Government of Sri Lanka strategy in digitalization of health records and introducing UID for health records? And also coupled with that is, can ICTA publish the digital Sri Lanka roadmap with timelines? Yes. Um... You may not know, but we have already done a lot of work in the health sector. 43 uh, hospitals are using the solution that we have given. Uh, but of course, uh, obviously, we have to, uh, like uh, in many foreign countries, uh, combine the, uh, the health records uh, into one database where a, a patient from uh, Candy goes to Hamban Tota, his records would be available there. Uh, so we are, uh, we are in the verge of uh, uh, combining two health solutions that we have done in the past into one. And uh, we, we feel that this is a, an extremely important uh, uh, solution, uh, but there is a lot of uh, privacy, uh, you know, uh, uh, privacy concerns that are coming up. Uh, so we are addressing them, but uh, health is one of the key areas, including the uh, the, the pharmaceuticals uh, cooperation, as well as the imports, as well as production in in uh, in this country. We are combining, and we are uh, we are having isolated solutions running at the moment. Uh, but we do want to combine them, and health is one of the key. Uh, areas that we are concentrating on at the moment. And Jayanta, the, the second part of the question was, can ICTA publish the uh, digital Sri Lanka roadmap with the timelines? Yes, we have already uh, published it. Uh, uh, we have already got the uh, 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 okay from the president. Uh, as you know, uh, the, the digital uh, or the Technology Ministry came uh, on on one of our, you know, the drives that we have done. Uh, so now we are going to combine 10 institutions into one uh, ministry. And uh, they are, we, we have already done the five-year map. And uh, it's, it's open to anyone. Actually, it will be open to anyone. And we have already uh, completed and done it. So it's, it's available to anyone who wants to see it. Uh, but uh, 
I hope, uh, I'm not sure whether we have done it in the, uh, uh, in fact, we had a, we, we actually came out uh, uh, with, uh, with a huge uh, uh, paper article on this, uh, depicting all our plans. Okay, Arvind, I have a question for you, which says, uh, is any of this data gathered being used to help with things like increasing education attainment and bringing disadvantaged groups into the workforce, stroke, increased labor participation of women, et cetera? If yes, some examples on how this is done would be helpful. Yeah, uh, you know, I've been answering a lot of questions online also. Uh, but for the uh, larger audience, um, I think uh, 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 what we need to recognize is any data if can be used uh, properly with the right consent, the right, uh, uh, you know, regulation backing it can really enable a lot of things, a lot of decision making. Uh, credit, I gave you an example, but I'll give you two examples in, um, in governance. Uh, we have something called an entitlement engine. We know what you are entitled to, but a lot of consumers don't know what they're entitled to. A lot of citizens don't know what schemes they're entitled to, what scholarships they're entitled to. So running a small, a data-driven AI engine, we, we call it the entitlements engine, brings out that this is based on your profile, your survey answers, and your identity. These are the five schemes that you can apply and you're eligible for, and you are not availing. So it brings a lot of people who are who, are, who don't have access, who don't have knowledge um, about such schemes into the, into, into, uh, into the welfare system and helps them. Scholarship is one area. We've seen the uptake of scholarship, the girl child scholarship in India, uh, you know, triple to go even five times higher because we made access available to them, told them there is a scholarship that exists for them and they availed of it. So uh, there is, and sports scholarships and um, girl child scholarships are a great example in education. Uh, lastly, in health, I think uh, data-driven health, which was somebody, and, and I know Jayanta was talking about, uh, AI today is helping in the pandemic like never before. Uh, what we do now is for telehealth, of course, one thing we have enabled is telehealth. And that's, again, a great example of agile policymaking. But also now, uh, you know, diagnostics are being done using AI. And this is private sector, a lot of public sector, a lot of uh, government, but a lot of startups, their AI algorithms are now able to pre-diagnose certain things sitting in remote areas where there is no laboratories or diagnostic centers available. So, uh, you know, data images are being used to diagnose uh, conditions that uh, otherwise uh, people in the rural setup will never have uh, been able to diagnose for months and years. So. Uh, access and affordability driven by data, driven by the right algorithms, ethical practices, ethical algorithmic practices are really um, um, helping and, and they are the way to go. And that's really fourth industrial revolution. Thank you, Arvind. Uh, Chinti, I'm going to come back to you. Um, a little more mundane uh, question. Um, during the um, pandemic, you know, there was lots of frustration people faced uh, because the so-called uh, fancy e-commerce sites crashed. Uh, uh, the, the supply chain just wasn't up to the chain. And I think the fact was that a lot of people spent a lot of money and investment on the front end and the back end was woefully inadequate. Um, what, uh, what is your advice to them? You know, to, to, to people to make sure that if you want to transcend from the old world to the new world of the new norm, uh, the digital world, uh, what are the key things you would believe that they should take heed of? Sure. Uh, I think that's a great question. And I think we all uh, suffered from not getting our sort of food delivered and uh, groceries delivered on time. So I would um, broadly, when you think about digital transformation, you actually think about digital out and digital in. Digital out is basically everything that you do with your customers. Um, to attract them, to transact with them, to engage with them, as well as now deliver to them versus them coming to you. So that is all about all the mobile apps, all the you know websites, uh, all the platforms, or even what I talked about from a conversational AI perspective, 
all about reaching out to the customer. When you think about digital in, there are actually two really important things that we need to really focus on. One is, are, are the, is the operational transformed also? So there's no point actually taking in an order if the rest of the chain is not integrated. And, and to that, you, I, I spoke about making sure your integrations, where you probably have so many legacy systems in the back end, how do you make sure that that information gets transferred uh, appropriately to the right place and a, an order is actually able to get delivered. So that, that's really important from an integration perspective. The second thing from an interoperability and operations perspective is data. You're collecting so much of data. Why not predict uh, what, uh, what that area might need? based on uh, previous orders, what this customer might need. For example, if Zofa was ordering something, you would probably have a pre-filled cart that you order regularly for, so that you're now you know, delivering that convenience to your customer, and that comes from data and insights. But the third thing in digital in and making sure that things really operate is actually the transformation of the workforce. You know, there is, you know, this is really important, the, the human resource that's actually doing it. We need to have a change in mindset. We need to think about how do we become more agile? How do our architectures become more uh, able to make these changes quickly? Um, and how do we really leapfrog? How do we take a, take a look at the process? Digitization is a great point in which you can evolve what you have been doing for years and years and years. You know, so instead of sort of taking a process and just simply automating it, ask the question, should this be renewed? Uh, should this evolve to now the most suitable way of delivering this? So really, you know, digital in and out, and especially in, inside your organization, really look at how you can transform the operations as well as how you can transform the workforce. Yeah, um, one question I'm going to ask uh, uh, Arvind, and I'm sure it'll have relevance to uh, to Jayanta as well, and I think he alluded to that uh, to a certain extent. You know, uh, our garments, both India and Sri Lanka, uh, we live and swear by the administrative and financial regulations. I mean, our bureaucrats love to throw the ARs and FRs in your face every time you, you try to do something. Uh, and digitalization, takes a lot of, you know, needs to cut through all of those ARs and FRs if you want to get anywhere. How did India do? And I can see Giant smiling. I'm sure Giant also had some experience. Maybe I'll start with you, Arvind. How did, because India, as you know, again, is a very strong bureaucratic uh, country. Uh, I'm sure we can learn some lessons or maybe Giant can give some lessons on how he handled it. But I'll start with you, Arvind. So on a lighter note, uh, we all inherited the same bureaucratic structure from uh, our colonial past. And, uh, you know, um, uh, India still trains a lot of Sri Lankan bureaucrats. So I think our, the DNA of the bureaucrats is, is the same. Uh, having said this, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, everybody's out there to make a change. I've been in bureaucracy also. So I, I have worn that hat inside the government. Um, and people are willing to make the change as long as they know that the culture you know, of startups, for example, is also inside the government. So this is a very big change that Prime Minister of India, Prime Minister Modi made. He launched something called a startup movement. And he said it's okay to fail. And that applied to bureaucrats also. You know, that's a simple thing to say, but you know, uh, as, as any startup, and I've done multiple startups in my life, I can tell you um, a five out of... Uh, 100 startups succeed. And that's a very good number. So uh, to, and having that, that culture is a very important thing. So we have a Startup India ministry or a department, you can call it now, which kind of not only helps the startup, but also in, in ensures that this kind of administrative reforms uh, are being, uh, you know, uh, are also being shared across and the successes are being shared across uh, ministries and departments. Uh, but I would just leave it with one thought that uh, I think it's all driven by a CEO and a country has a CEO who believes in digital, who believes in startups and pushes for it. In our case, the prime minister. Uh, 
um, and he's really led from the front in this. So like any company needs a CEO to drive the change, this is the CEO that you need one leader to drive the change. Janta, I, I'm sure you have, a, we have a CEO as well at the heading the country who believes strongly in it. I'm sure you can add to that. Uh, yes, obviously, uh, you know, we, we have been uh, sometimes victims of this uh, coming from private sector, obviously. Um, uh, as Aravind rightly said, you know, this bureaucracy has been there for long, long years, coming, starting from the subject clerk and the subject file, right? <laughs> so you own the file and you have a subject clerk. So what, do you, what are you going to do? He is on leave. There is no other way to do it. Uh, and also, this uh, came up, uh, you know, slowly. We have got out of this, even in private banks. You won't believe this was that. Uh, so then later on, even at the highest level, uh, like additional secretary, you assigned a particular subject. Now, we uh, today, uh, it's more additional secretaries are development. So there is no specific, uh, you, you, can, you have to sort of the training is going on because with IT, one of the biggest factors that come in, that can come in is the multifacet, the, the ability for a person, uh, even, the, even in a bank that as we used to, if you remember, first he checks the person, the ID, and then put it bank. But today uh, the subject, uh, the teller front end is a is a multi talented multi facet uh, subject specialist. So gradually we are overcoming this, and uh, you won't believe that uh, some of the functions are owned by the government, some of the governments uh, departments, uh, which is not relevant at all in today's context uh, with IT. You know it doesn't make any sense. Uh, so I cannot name these functions but some of these functions are owned by some of the departments. Uh, when you go for ID, uh, national ID project, uh, passports, some of these functions, so not anymore. Uh, so they, they, they themselves have realized this now. So the, now the biggest problem is you don't have physical files. So you don't have to go serially. Right? If a file goes from A to B, B to C, C to D, the same file can have multiple tasks on that same file being done on the same day. Because otherwise, you know, you can say hey, that file is on the other desk, it's been managed by this. So until then, I can't do anything. That particular way of doing things have slowly gradually vanished today with the advent of a good good systems. So I think uh, most of these things are gradually, uh, you know, uh, coming into place and uh, with very good uh, IT solutions, uh, they themselves have realized that you don't need to go serially on, on a process. Uh, and uh, the government has also accepted, as uh, you rightly said, uh, the president who is coming from the technology sector uh, he has uh, specifically instructed us. Uh, that is a very reason that these 10 institutions under technology have been brought, uh, which you may see are not related. Now, if you see the I, uh, national uh, uh, person, personal uh, ID card uh, department or the, uh, uh, the, the person's registration department uh, coming under technology, uh, which someone would say it's not relevant, no, but it has become very relevant because this is going to be the base document. So that's why it has been brought under precedent. So things would uh, ease up and I'm very confident that uh, this would ease up uh, very soon. Okay, uh, we are coming to the end of the thing, but I'd like to ask my panelists out here with me, uh, the final take, your 30 second view on, on, the, on the subject of what we discussed. We are very optimistic about the changes that are happening. I just want to say that bank, banking industry is waiting to partner with the right set of partners and we don't want to do it ourselves. 
we are much more open for partnership and waiting for that partnership to happen. Also, yeah, I think uh, I think the digital uh, the way forward is digitally, right? I think uh, just as much as we've heard from all our panels, uh, uh, it also brings in a lot of efficiency, right? And I've I've seen it uh, with what we've done with the transport sector, and there's obviously a lot of uh, improvements that can take place with digital, right? Uh, it's just that the the service runs much more eff efficiently, and I think that's that's what uh, that's what we need to learn and then essentially drive that through. To ensure that every, the citizens of our country benefits out of this. Yanti. So three things, I think. Um, one, to help reduce the digital divide. Um, you know, I, 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 we heard about the infrastructure improving and certainly not just our literacy rate, but digital literacy rate, uh, you know, help that go move forward as well. I, I think it can start with actually leveraging digital for education. And I don't just mean uh, Zoom learning. Uh, I mean, actually leveraging uh, a learning platform to educate our kids so that they also get a little bit more digitally savvy. Uh, and we sort of improve that uh, as a whole, as a community. Last but not least, I think this is an opportunity for the industrial revolution. As Zupa very rightfully said, um, let's leverage it to leapfrog, not just to copy, uh, but to really leapfrog our economy forward. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I think all what has to be said is said, but I just want to make one point. Uh, you know, somebody was telling me, and I'm sure this is right, that Sri Lanka had a national ID card well before lots of other countries, but we remained flat on that. We didn't digitalize. Others went ahead. Uh, I think it's good that we have started it now, better late than never. But I'm sure that with the, with the plan and the roadmap, we will see some very exciting changes going forward. So with that, um, let me thank uh, Arvind and Jayanta for some very illuminating uh, presentations. And to my panelists, Bengumal, to um, Zulfa, and to Chinti for some very interesting insights. Thank you.